several months ago, I was in a discussion with some Latter Day Saint missionaries who I developed a you know months long relationship with, and they've been having all kinds of trouble because Mormons believe that faith and works should have some kind of balance and harmony. Mm-hmm. But they were visiting this Baptist pastor, much like you once were a Baptist mm-hmm. pastor, who was hammering them on the points you just described, and they were stuck. And I handed them your articles on faith and obedience, and they just texted me back and said, "Tell Ken." These are amazing. We're going to use these, you know, next time we talk to our Baptist friends. So you helped Thanks, my Matt. Mormon friends. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to have that hanging over my head forever. You're the guy that helped the like Mormons, the sword of you know, substantiate yes. their theology, right? Hello and welcome to another high intensity episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken. I'm Matt Swaim along with my colleague Ken Hensley. Uh, We're with the Coming Home Network. And if you don't know much about us, come visit us at chnetwork.org. We're a network of all kinds of people from every background you can imagine who Mm -hmm. decided uh, after much study and prayer and soul searching to enter the Catholic Church. If that's you or if you take issue with that, let us know. Hit us up at chnetwork.org. Ken Hensley, how are you doing today? I'm doing really good, Matt. I'm glad to be back with you and glad to launch into our subject for today. Yeah, we're on to faith alone and doing a little bit more with it. We've been talking a little bit about it. Uh, We hit on it in the previous episode, but where are we digging in today? What point in this whole narrative of faith alone are we going to tackle? Okay, well, what I'm wanting to do here is I'm wanting to tell um, my story, to tell the story of how I came over really a, a period of some years to abandon the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith alone, and to embrace the Catholic view on these issues. And I want to do it, um, I want to build the case point by point in kind of an inductive way by simply t- uh, telling really chronologically how, how, how it came about for me. So what we did last um, episode was I introduced the doctrine of justification by faith alone, described what it is, what it teaches, and whatnot. And today I want to begin my critique in terms of my own story. Okay? When when Protestants make the case for the Reformation doctrine of justification, sola fide, by justifica- I mean, justification by faith alone, um, what they will typically do, of course, is begin with St. Paul, where they see it actually taught in the New Testament, and we'll be coming back to that. But they also present a particular line of reasoning that I want to look at today, and it, it goes like this. Justification, you Catholics, <laughs> let's say, must be by faith alone. After all, if our obedience to God was actually something that is required in order for us to receive the blessing of justification or eternal life, then God would not receive all the glory for the great work of salvation. Then you and I would have something in which to boast. Then you and I would be able to say, at least in part, that we had saved ourselves, that we had earned our own salvation. And since this cannot be, I mean, St. Paul says it, not of works lest any man should boast, since this cannot be, justification must be by faith alone. Okay, there's a particular line of thought that I'm describing here. And what I want to say is that the path away from the doctrine of justification by faith alone in my life, it began when I came to see that this line of thinking simply isn't the thinking of Scripture. It simply isn't biblical. And that's what I want to try and unfold today. All right. And before you get into it, I need you to know, well, first of all, this is there are a couple of articles mm-hmm. that you've written about this for the Coming Home Network. Uh, one is on faith and obedience in the Old mm-hmm. Testament. Another one is about whether Old Testament figures were legalists um, because yeah. of what you're about to lay out. And um, several months ago, I was in a discussion with some Latter-day Saint missionaries who I developed a you know months-long relationship with, and they've been having all kinds of trouble because Mormons believe that faith and works should have some kind of balance and harmony. Mm-hmm. But they were visiting this Baptist pastor, much like you once were a Baptist mm-hmm. pastor, who was hammering them on the points you just described, and they were stuck. And I handed them your articles on faith and obedience, and they just texted me back and said, "Tell Ken, th- these are amazing. We're going to use these, you know, next time we talk to our Baptist friends." So you Thanks, helped my Matt. Mormon friends. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to have that hanging over my head forever. You're the guy that helped the like Mormons, the sort of you know, Damocles. substantiate yes. their theology, right? Well, um, okay. As I said, the path away from me began with me beginning to realize that this line of thinking was not the thinking of Scripture, and that's that's what I want to get into. And ironically, Matt, um, this 
occurred while I was still attending Fuller Theological Seminary in preparation for a life in Protestant ministry. So this is where the story begins. And I can still remember the moment. My favorite New Testament professor at the time casually just tossed this major wrench into my theological works, into the gears. He had been talking about Luther and Calvin. He was talking about faith and obedience and what scripture has to say about these things. And all of a sudden he says this class, something like this. He says, you know, it's a curious thing, but when you think of it, the Old Testament amounts to essentially nothing more than a series of stories, one story after another of God and his relationships with men and women. And he said, never in these stories do we find God calling his people to receive his blessings by faith alone. Instead, he said, the pattern we always see in these stories is trust me, faith, do what I tell you to do, whatever it is, obedience, and I will bless you, blessing. The pattern, he said, is always in the Old Testament, faith leading to obedience, resulting in blessing. Okay, now let me clarify this a little bit by contrasting it, because the pattern that we see in the doctrine of justification, if you can think about it as a pattern, um, the pattern of faith alone, it's it's very different from this. In fact, it's it's the opposite in some ways. Um, with, doctor, with, with justification by faith alone, the pattern is trust me, faith, receive the blessing, in this case, the blessing of justification, you receive it by faith alone, and then do what I tell you to do, obedience, not in order to receive the blessing, which you've already received by faith alone, but obedience is in gratitude for having already received the blessing, or is the outworking of God's work of grace in our lives, okay? And that's how it works at the Coming Home Network, as a matter of fact. Uh, Marcus says, are you willing to do the work? And I say yes, and then he pays me. And out of gratitude for the fact that he's paid me, I then go on to do the work. Yeah, okay. And you're Actually, that's not how of, it works at all, right? It's <laughs> yeah, not how it works at all in real yeah, life. And you're reminding me of Romans 4, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, okay? Yeah, good point, though. So the pattern that we see in the doctrine of justification is really the opposite. And the professor was saying, no, the pattern we find in the Bible, and he's, he's thinking of the Old Testament here at this point, the pattern we find is trust me and do what I command you to do, and you will receive the promised blessing. Okay, now the reason this struck me is that this is the very pattern that I had been taught to think of as completely antithetical to the gospel, you know, as, as representing essentially the very definition of, of um, legalism of what it would mean to be, you know, to embrace a damning system of works righteousness. And yet he was saying, this is, uh, this is the pattern of every story in the Old Testament. And he wanted to give some illustrations. He said, think of Noah. Noah was promised salvation through the flood. Was this blessing, uh, was this a blessing he was to receive by faith alone? And the answer was obviously, well, not of all. I mean, not at all. Because in order to be saved, Noah did have to trust God. He had to have faith, but he, ha he also had to build the ark. He had to build the boat. The and if that's not that works, see, I don't know what it is. I mean, it, it, you ever build a boat? I haven't. Yeah, I don't want to put in that kind of work. Yeah, ever build a boat out in the middle of the desert or wherever you happen to be, and a boat that's like 600 feet long and a, you know, 75 floors tall? Yeah, he had, to, he, he had to obey. I mean, he had to trust God, and he also had to obey God in order to be saved through the flood. The pattern that we see is faith leading to obedience, resulting in blessing. And I want to go a little bit deeper here. Of course, faith was essential. In fact, I would say faith was at the heart of it, because if Noah hadn't believed what God was saying to him, warning him of the coming flood, he wouldn't have been saved. The reason he wouldn't have been saved is precisely because he wouldn't have built a boat. <laughs> if he didn't trust what God was saying, and he wouldn't is... have gone out and built the boat. This is what's so funny to me because, again, I didn't grow up with this line of thinking. I, um, it, my understanding as someone from the Wesleyan Arminian tradition was faith leads to obedience, leads to blessing, as opposed to what you're just describing, which is faith leads to blessing and then you obey out of gratitude. I mean, a question like that for me is like, yeah. was Noah saved because he believed or was Noah saved because he built the ark? Would have made no sense to me, you know, because it was like, well, he was saved because he yeah. believed and built the ark, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I guess this is good because you're able to 
present the Wesleyan view, and I'm which is pretty I'm, similar to the Catholic view, actually. Yeah, yeah, and I'm presenting the Reformed view, which is kind of the opposite. Okay, but the point is with Noah and the illustration is that in the story of Noah, we see that he had to trust God and he had to do what God ha- had told him to do in order to be saved. Faith and obedience were required. The professor took us to the story of Abraham, which I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail. In the letter of Romans, St. Paul refers to Abraham as the father of those who walk in the steps of faith. And Protestants generally view Abraham as the great Old Testament illustration of how we are called to relate to God. The great illustration of faith alone, if you will. Well, what do we see in Abraham's relationship with God? It begins in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, where God comes to Abram and says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Notice that first word, go, okay? Go, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And by you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the original great blessing promised of the Abrahamic covenant. And then we read, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And again, the professor read this to us, and then he asked, is this an example of someone who is going to receive the promised blessing by faith alone? And then this pregnant silence. Or he said, let me put this another way. He said, show of hands, is there anyone in the room who thinks that Abraham would have received the blessings promised here if he had not left his country and his kindred and his father's house? And again, I would have been interested to see what the what the room looked like after that question. Well, if everyone's just sort of like, I guess this sort of like... Is this a trick? Yeah. 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 Is this some kind of trick? Because, I mean, so far, it looks like the same pattern we saw with Noah. It looks like Abraham needs to trust God, and he needs to do what God says. He has to leave Ur of the Chaldees. He has to go in order to enjoy the blessings promised. Now, for those who were skeptical in the room, and, and, and like I said, the, the hands probably look like this, you know, in the room. For those who were skeptical about the idea that Abraham's obedience was actually a, a part of what was necessary, that it was actually necessary for him to receive the blessing, the professor had us turn to Genesis 22. This is where God commands Abraham to offer up his only son, Isaac, on Mount Moriah as a sacrifice. And you all know the story. Abraham obeys. Abraham goes there. He's about to kill his son. The angel of the Lord steps in, intervenes, and stops him. And and listen to what the Lord says to Abram at this point. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, hmm, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. By your descendants shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed, have obeyed my voice. My voice. Yes. Yes. And yeah, and notice what's happening here. The Lord is coming to Abram and he's repeating the promises that he made way back when, you know, years and years and years and years before in Genesis chapter 12. And he's explicitly saying that he's going to fulfill these promises because of Abraham's obedience. It's an if then clause, right? If you do yeah. this, then this thing will happen. And so yeah. Abraham does it and then the thing happens. I mean, yeah, go from your land and your kindred, and I will bless you. Now here, it's pretty oh, straightforward, right? Yeah, because you have done this, I will bless you. Okay, the professor turned to one more passage, Genesis twenty-six verses one through six, and I have to tell you, this is a passage. I mean, when I read it, you're going to think, well, this just sounds like a basic passage in the Old Testament. But it, this was a text that knocked me over when I read it and really listened to what it was saying. At this point in the narrative, Genesis twenty-six, Abram has died. Abraham has died. The Lord appears to Abraham's son, Isaac, in order to renew the promises that he had made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and renewed in Genesis 15 and Genesis 22. And this is what he says. The Lord appeared to him, that is Isaac, and he said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I will tell you. I will be with you and will bless you. You In other words, remain in the land of Canaan as I had commanded Abraham. I will fulfill the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your descendants. Here he's repeating the same things again. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. 
by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves because Abraham obeyed my voice. And this is the part that killed me because he just beats it in because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Sounds like pure legalism. This is why I'm going to, you know, Isaac, this is why I'm going to fulfill the promise. I renew it with you. I'm going to fulfill these promises. Doesn't even mention faith here because Abraham obeyed me, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And yet I, I want to say again that it was Abraham's faith that was at the heart of everything. This is clearly true, even as it was with Noah. If Abraham had not believed God, that's the heart. He wouldn't have left everything to wander through the desert and end up in this place that went up with the Canaanites and Perizzites and Hittites and all this other Jebusites. He, Don't forget the Jebusites. Yeah, or the Girgashites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah or the, the strong bulls of Bashan. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't forget any of those. Okay, he certainly wouldn't have been willing to go up on Mount Moriah and offer up his only son, Isaac, whom, whom the Lord had promised him. So faith was at the heart of it. But you know what? Here's the thing that came to me at this point. I realized that if you read through the life of Abraham in Genesis, and you ask yourself the question, according to what I see actually emphasized in the narrative, in the text, the narrative of Abraham's life, Upon what basis is God going to keep his covenant with Abraham to bless him, fulfill the promises made to him? I think the honest answer I had to come to was, well, the answer is Abraham's faithful obedience. It's faith leading to obedience, because he wouldn't have obeyed if he didn't believe. Faith leading to obedience resulting in the blessing of God. And it's interesting to, to point, and I don't want to go down a side road sure. of, uh, of this too far, but um, it's still more complicated than that because, you know, God's promises, you know, he blesses Abraham because he obeys, but God never undoes a covenant, right? As it says in, uh, where is it, uh, 2 Timothy, St. Paul says, yeah. if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. Abraham would have missed the blessing, but God still made the promise. And it would have figured it out another way, much like it did through the line of David all the way down to Jesus. There were right. horrible things that happened to the people who disobeyed their end of the deal, but God still kept it going all the way down to the Messiah. Yes, yeah, so, so the covenant is in place, and it's going to be fulfilled, and it's fulfilled in the new covenant. But that doesn't mean that you, in, are you, you going along with person, it or, on your end or not? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Are you going to okay. obey or, or just ride it out? Well, the professor decided he wasn't done, so he, he went forward to Moses and the children of Israel, and he asked the question again, did they inherit the promised land by faith alone? And I, I can still remember, everybody in the room is sort of like, I mean, we're a bunch of, mainly a bunch of reformed, uh, you know, um, Protestants, and he's asking this question, did they inherit the promised land by faith alone? And then he said something along the lines of, well, let's see, um, they had to trust God, and they had to kill the Passover lamb. Um, they had to apply the blood to the doorposts of their homes and the lentils. Um, they had to cook the lamb and they had to eat it. They had to walk out of Egypt. They had to cross the Red Sea. They had to follow the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night for 40 years through the wilderness. They had to come to the Jordan. They had to cross the Jordan and they had to take the cities of Canaan one by one. That to sounds more to me like a blessing. saving uh, system of works righteousness than a damning one. Right. Yeah, it's a saving system for sure, but it surely does not sound like a faith alone system. Not at all. Not at he all. He went forward, and I remember he mentioned Naaman the Syrian, you know, who was cleansed of his leprosy. Was he cleansed of his leprosy by faith alone? Well, again, let's see. He had to trust what Elisha the prophet told him, so there's faith. But then, in order to be cleansed, he had to go down to the Jordan River, and he had to dip himself seven times. And you and know what? Basically, this isn't confined. Said, to the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, Paul in Ephesians 6, which this is one of my passages that my parents love to quote to me the most, right? Ephesians 6, 1, children obey your, poor, your parents in the <laughs> yeah. Lord for this is yeah. right. Uh, but it goes on to say in verse 2, honor your father yeah. and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise so, so that it go. may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Like, yeah. I mean, it's you right know, there. I mean, Paul even cites that. You know, it's funny, the passages that become your favorite at different stages of life. Yeah, that was not my favorite as a kid. My favorite my passage favorite. now is fall down before the hoary head. That's right. There you go. <laughs> do, do honor. 
well, uh, before the white haired man. Um, this is this is common yeah. sense, though. I mean, yeah, this is, it, it's not just the pages of scripture. This is how like ordinary life works. Ken. Yeah, and I mean, think about it is- in Terminator 2, right? If Arnold is saying to John and Sarah Connor, come with me if you want to live, you know what? He's the one doing the saving. Arnold the Terminator is. But in some sense, Sarah yeah. and John Connor have to accept the invitation or they won't be saved. And they have to come with him. Yeah, if they if they want to live. That's a very nice Austrian accent right it's there. It's not very good. It's not my, okay. not my best Well, the accent. professor, this is so simple in, in a way so far. Now, I mean, I can hear people throwing in all kinds of theology. Well, what about, but what about, and, and I, I, I apologize for those who want us to get to bottom lines instantly, but I'm, I'm building a case in terms of my own story. And so it's going to be step by step, precept upon precept. But he, he said, he said to us that, or he reminded us that he could go on with illustration after illustration, because the Old Testament is this one story after another. And in all of these stories, the pattern is the same faith leading to obedience resulting in God's blessing. The pattern is never in these stories, faith alone. Then you receive the blessing, and then you obey God, not because you have to, to receive the blessing, but out of gratitude because you've already received it. You see what I'm saying, okay? Now, what struck me first, Matt, at this point, really was just how easy it was to see that this is indeed the pattern that we find in Scripture. Every every single story taught it. And I remember thinking to myself at this point, something along the lines of, you know, if if God wanted to teach the world that the blessing of eternal life must be received by faith alone, and that if our obedience is in any way a part of the equation, then he would not receive the glory. This is a damning system where works righteousness. This cannot be. Why in the world did he fill the entire Bible with the stories of men and women whose obedience is always an integral part of the equation, and who actually do trust God and do what he says and receive his blessing. Now, there's something else that struck me. It struck me that these simple biblical stories, stories that a child could read, stories that a child could understand, you know, you mentioned the simplicity of this. It struck me how these stories just tore the heart out of this idea that in order for God to receive, quote unquote, all the glory, salvation has to be by faith alone and not include in any way our response to God in terms of our obedience. These these stories just tore the heart out of that notion. And yet that notion was at the very core of the way I thought in terms of my Reformed faith. Remember, the Reformed way of thinking, faith and obedience, tend to be viewed as near opposites of one another. I mean, the way it's set up is you, you, you either receive God's justification, his blessing, by faith alone, by faith alone, in which case God gets all the glory, in which case you have nothing in which to boast, man is humbled in the dust, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. or you receive God's blessings by obedience, in which case you have earned God's blessing, and this is a damning system of works righteousness, and God will not, cannot receive all the glory. This is the and way it was gonna- set up. Yeah, and you're going to get into this more here in a little bit, but if God is the one alone who is supposed to receive the glory, then why don't we just have a list of the things that we are supposed to do and believe? Why do we have stories? Why do we have models? Why do we have example after example of how this is lived out? And I know you're going to get into this later. Why don't we say there was a man and he built a boat? Why do we have to know his name was Noah, right? Noah seems to me like he's getting some pretty good press over this thing. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. But it's not detracting from the glory of God at all. Somehow it isn't. Yeah, it's yeah. somehow it isn't, and that's, we're going to come to that in a moment. Well, um, I want to mention one uh, one um, book, because re- recently, um, meaning over the, over the last 10, 20 years, a number of Protestant New Testament scholars, a couple of their names, N.T. Wright, Robert Gundry, there are some others as well, they have challenged the Reformation doctrine of sola fide. They've, they've begun to challenge it, while, while remaining Protestants, and Protestants that come from a Reformed kind of background, challenging it. And there has been a, uh, a strong reaction from those on the Reformed side of the um, table. Um, one of them, his name is John Piper, very popular author and teacher, preacher. And Twitter user. Yeah. And he, and he read it. He wrote a book uh, titled Counted Righteous in Christ. Okay. Counted Righteous in Christ. 
And he explains in the uh, introduction or the foreword, I can't remember, to this book, he explains what motivated him to write this book in defense of justification by faith alone in the imputed, legally credited righteousness of Christ. And this is what he says. This is the beginning of his book. I am jealous for Christ to get all the glory he deserves for the work of justification. My concern is that in the more recent challenges to this doctrine that I am about to address, he is robbed of a great part of his glory. Okay? So this represents a way of thinking that was in my bones and that I fully understood. And and it just made sense. After all, how can God receive all the glory, Matt, for your salvation if your obedience to God is a part of what is required in order for you to receive this blessing of salvation. It just seems logical. Yeah, seems... and in most of my conversations with Calvinists that stalled out during my, you know, mm-hmm. Bible college Wesleyan holiness days, they stalled out on this point because the thing that people kept coming back to anytime I'd press them on any point was the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty yeah, and the of full, God. You... And the full glory of God, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that if you're involved, I know I've heard many preachers say things like, if your obedience, even one tenth of one percent, is mixed into the equation, you have destroyed the gospel of grace. You have turned it on its head. You have now created a doctrine of justification, essentially by works, earning salvation. Okay, so I understood this way of thinking very well. And at the same time, though, questions were beginning to creep into my mind based on this pattern that I could see clearly now was the pattern of um of relationship in the Old Testament. I mean, it's clear that Noah's obedience was a part of what was required. Even a child would understand. I mean, it's clear. He had to build the boat in order to be saved through the flood. He had to do it. Well, does this mean that God didn't receive all the glory for Noah's salvation through the flood? Does that mean then that Noah is in heaven right now just boasting for all eternity and how he saved himself by building an ark? I knew the answer to that was no. And and so again, it was like, hold on. In the story, faith and obedience are required, and yet it doesn't have these nasty implications that I had been taught to think that it it would have to have, that it must have. Same thing with Abraham. Abraham's obedience was obviously required. He had to leave Ur the Chaldees. He had to go. He had to offer up his son Isaac. He would not have received the blessing for himself if he had not done that. Well, so does that mean that Abraham's in heaven right now? I mean, is he laying in some hammock somewhere, you know, sipping, you know, Arnold Palmer's and just bragging day and night about how he earned his, uh, you know, he earned the uh, the land of Canaan by by his obedience? No, he's he's sipping Singapore slings. <laughs> Sing, okay, but he's saying the same thing. He's still bragging, he's, right? He's not boasting, right? He's not bragging. Okay. He's just glad to be there, I would think. Because, yeah, Singapore slings, he's too wasted to think about whether it's his yeah, word or God's, that, right? You don't want any of that okay. happening to you. Moses and the children of Israel is the same thing. They obviously had to obey God in order to receive the blessing. You know, they said they had to offer the lamb, they had to walk, they had to follow. When they sinned, they had to go to the priest and offer their sacrifice and confess it. They had to eat the manna every day. They had to trudge through this desert on burning, blistering feet in order to inherit the promised land. And yet, is there any sense in Scripture that, that, that those who made it to the promised land are up in heaven boasting, boasting, boasting? Well, God. You did part of it. I mean, you took care of the Egyptian armies, you took care of the Red Sea for us, but we did the walking. We actually went there. So you get some glory, we get some glory. You saved us, yeah, you did, partly, and we saved ourselves partly. Well, in all of these illustrations of stories from the Old Testament, the question was, are all of these illustrations are they giving us illustrations of, of the ways in which God doesn't want us to relate to him? You follow what I'm saying? I mean, are all these stories in the Old Testament, are they there to teach us what a system of works looks like? You know, something that we don't want to imitate? Yeah, don't be like Abraham. He earned his way into heaven. Yeah, don't be like Noah. Don't be like Abraham. Don't be like Moses and the children of Israel. Don't be like Naaman the Syrian. I mean, is, is, this is what I was asking myself. Is this why the stories are there? And if so, why are Noah and Abraham and Moses and Naaman, why are they consistently held up in the New Testament as examples for you and I to imitate? Even by Jesus himself. Yes. Yeah, and I thought about Protestant preachers. I, well, I thought about myself. I was a Protestant preacher. It was standard 
to use these Old Testament characters as illustrations in your sermons. And most often it was illustrations of something good. <laughs> it, was, it, it was an illustration of what you want to do. Well, this doesn't make sense if, if their lives illustrate a, a, a system of legalism, a system of, you know, you trust God and, and do what he says and receive the, the, the blessing. And when I came to Hebrews chapter 11, that one hits like a brick too. Because in Hebrews 11, the author runs through a long list of Old Testament heroes of faith. In fact, the passage is referred to often, right, as the, uh, what is it called? The, the Hall of Fame or the, the, the Faith Hall of Fame. The Hall of Faith, Hall of faith right? Yeah. yeah, the Hall of Faith. Okay, the author goes through this long list and he presents these people as models for Christians to emulate. And in each case, what are we modeling? This pattern of faith leading to obedience, resulting in blessing. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval as righteous. By faith, Noah, being warned by God of events yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. By faith, Moses left Egypt. By faith, this, by faith, that, it goes on and on and on. You see what kind of a what a collision course this is on with this idea that no nope, salvation must be by faith alone otherwise God does not receive the glory and we have room to boast and All it comes of these back stories. to yeah it comes back to what you were saying last uh time around about Luther wrestling with James where he says things like faith without works uh -huh. is dead or we see that a man is justified by you know his righteous deeds and not by faith alone and this is this is just how the bible is writ you know, this is just how it works. And it seems to me uh, that unless you go through the mental gymnastics to intentionally interpret these things, you, you, we talk all the time about the plain sense of Scripture, mm -hmm, right? We mm -hmm. were talking about that with Sola Scriptura in our series about how these things are supposed to be so perspicacious, so clear on their face that anybody can come to the Bible and understand just by reading it what God wants from them. Well, if that's the case, the clearest, simplest, plainest sense of what God wants from us is to believe and obey. And we'll be blessed. Yeah, if you were just a, in a childlike way, just simply reading the stories of Scripture and reading it through, you would you would just naturally think, yeah, I need to do the same thing. I need to trust God, and I need to walk out and do what God tells me to do, and I'll be blessed. You need to trust and obey, for there's yeah, no and, other way and of course, to be happy problem, in Jesus than to trust and obey. Yeah, yeah, and of course, the only problem with that, Luther is going to say, and Melanchthon and Calvin and everyone since is going to say, yeah, but Paul. So we will get to him, okay? But I, but I wanted to sit on what we have here and what we see, because what was becoming clear to me, and again, I was back at, I was at Fuller Theological Seminary here, um, still at the time that this was beginning to hit me, this one issue. It, it was becoming clear to me that in the thinking of Scripture, scriptural thinking, faith and the obedience that naturally flows from faith, they were not conceived as opposites of one another. They were not conceived as even being in tension one, with one another. In fact, they were conceived as nearly interchangeable. When you look at these lives, Noah, Abraham, so forth. I remember the professor asking the class, because he wanted to kind of drill this into us. I remember him asking the class, and this is a question you asked a while ago. So was Noah saved from the flood by his faith, or was it by his obedience? Take your pick. And, and that's where the room just froze. You know, take your pick. It's either or, right? I mean, it's either faith alone or it's uh, earning salvation. It's either works. It's faith or it's works. Was he saved by his faith or was he saved by his obedience in building the ark? Take your pick. And how about Abraham? Did he receive the promise by faith alone or obedience? Take your pick. How about Moses? How about the children of Israel? How about Naaman the Syrian? All these stories. Was God responding to their faith or was God responding to their obedience? Which was it? And it was beginning to seem clear to me, Matt, that the answer was, well, both and, both and, and not either or, that there, there was something wrong with this either or. It was always faith and obedience. And, and because the two were viewed in scripture as virtually interchangeable, you could say two sides of a coin, at times, this is what I began to see, at times a person's faith could be highlighted in the narrative as being the reason for God's having blessed him. For instance, in Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. 
And at other times, a person's obedience could be highlighted, highlighted as the reason that God blessed him. For instance, when the angel says, because you have done this, I will indeed bless you. And this comes back again to something that in your Reformed theological mindset, you would separate into two thoughts. But the church all along, and again, my particular Christian uh, Protestant tradition had never separated out. And that's what we talked about last week with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, continuing into verse mm -hmm. 10. So in your thinking, you would have said Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Pause. Second thought is how you would have thought about it. Yeah. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I would have never have thought of those things as two separate and distinct yeah. thoughts. Yeah, I would have said verses 8 and 9 are talking about justification, faith alone, not of works, and I would have taken works to mean obedience of any kind, not, of, not obedience lest any man boast, there's that line of thought, uh, that's justification. And then I would have said, Verse 10, though, is talking about sanctification, which is completely separate. Once God has justified me by faith alone... Then you can start being a good person. Well, well then he also begins to sanctify me, and that's where good works come in. Oh, but I'm they sorry. have nothing to do with it receiving the It wouldn't be you being blessing. a good person. It would be you being letting God turn yeah. you into a good person. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Well, let me bring this to a close. It would be another 10 years in my life, Matt, before the word Catholic would enter my mind. Seriously another decade before it would even enter my mind. But this, I can see looking back that this is where it started. This is where I saw for the first time that the way I reasoned about faith and obedience as a Reformed Protestant was somehow fundamentally flawed. There was some fly in the ointment. There was some flaw in the way that I had been taught to reason about faith and obedience it simply wasn't the way that the biblical authors reasoned about it. And the way I have been taught to think, faith had to be carefully, carefully sequestered <laughs> and separated from obedience. It had to be treated as the sole instrument through which we receive God's blessing. Only in that way could the nature of salvation as gift, as pure gift, as grace be preserved. But in the Bible, I just saw something entirely different. And because of that, suddenly, really for the first time, the idea that obedience might be as necessary for us as it was for Noah and Abraham and Moses and the Israelites and Naaman, the idea that obedience might be as necessary for us as it was for them began to sound a little less impossible. I'll just say that. The door was cracked open. To ask the question, well, why couldn't faith and obedience be required for us as well in order to receive the blessing? And of course, after that, I began wanting to read the New Testament in the light of this pattern I'd seen in the Old Testament. And that this is where we're going to go in our next episode, is I began to see that this pattern of faith leading to obedience resulting in blessing, it's, it's not a pattern that, that, that comes to a slammed door in its face at the end of the Old Testament. But it's a pattern that we can see working its way right through the New Testament. And that's where we'll pick up. Yeah. I, and it just want to make sure that people know we're going to pick up because the people who uh, don't come from Reformed backgrounds are saying, well, duh, Ken. I mean, obviously. But the people who do come from Reformed backgrounds have already come up with like 15 passages from Paul that they're furiously writing down and getting ready to put into the comments. And just want to let you yeah. know, as Ken said earlier, we are going to get into St. Paul, I assure you, <laughs> as part of this whole question of sola fide. Yeah. So, um, in the meantime, all of those questions. In the meantime, yes, we got to hold on to those. Yes, and sir. Uh, we will be back next time around next week with more on this question of sola fide, faith alone. And if you've got any questions or comments or things that you hope we address in upcoming episodes, because we didn't have time in this short segment here, please let us know. Please visit us at chnetwork.org. Tell your friends to come subscribe. We would love to. Love to hear from you, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks so much, Ken. Have a great day. Thank you, Matt. Have a great day.